Welcome back to part 2. Now I think the hardware in-depth review I covered in part 1 tells a clear story of the gap these machines presented. But as I always say, software is the real deciding factor in all of this. Before you watch this part though, if you haven't watched the hardware and operating system review of these two 16-bit monsters, then please check it out with the link below or on screen. So moving on to a sample of games across these machines, we get a good spread of just how the numbers fall once developers started using the kit. Now of note is that both machines ran the same 68000 CISC CPU with 32-bit registers but could only process 16 bits within an external cycle, meaning 32 bits actually took two cycles to complete. Now the exact same assembly code could be written on one and ran on the other, but with all the extra chips within the Amiga, not everyone was was inclined to use them, aside the portal chip, which was just a requirement to produce sound. Now, before we dive into the games, I need to explain how these machines generated their respective displays. Both machines use bit planes, which are memory mapped to the display, which means that the bits in RAM are analogous to the pixels on screen. They are mapped in a contiguous block that corresponds to the display. Now, the planes part of this means they do not use the packed chunky pixel format, which you get in modern bitmap PC, GPU or console displays. Instead, each plane, a flat 2D map, is comprised of a set number of bits that are merged into one for the final output, but they do have some differences on how they achieve this. Simply this method helped because the RAM was not fast enough to draw huge chunks within the vertical blank stage across to the screen buffer. So using planes you can store the memory in separate parts of your RAM and then read them in parallel to the screen buffer which gives you a quicker result and no waste of those bits. There are limitations obviously, certainly with 3D graphics and animation making it much harder but this is where the Amiga's blitter and hardware scrolling all come into effect. For the ST, it has a much simpler and more consistent method due to its single 32KB block of video RAM or really registers. These hold the entire display content which is fixed, meaning every single resolution on the machine has to fit inside these 32,000 bytes of space. It provides a simple linear construction of each displayed image, starting with the high resolution. This uses a single plane with each block of bits being a one-to-one -one map of the final pixel display. This resolution offers a 640 pixel width display, which equates to 640 bits across the screen, one bit per pixel. This runs for 400 lines or rows to represent the height of this image. So doing the maths, we have 640 bits, times 400 lines which equals 256,000 bits or 32 kilobytes of space which nicely fits inside our video block. Now at a single bit per pixel level we can only represent black or white on or off 0 or 1 giving a monochrome display. The next step up we have two planes instead of one but to get to this we need to make some space by halving the pixel height of rows giving us a new medium resolution of 640 by 200. The exact same calculation applies here giving us 128,000 bits per plane. As we now have two though we can add these together giving us two bits per pixel or four colors. Now this still all fits inside the same 32 kilobytes of space as each plane is only 16 kilobytes each as we have reduced the resolution. Now I'm sure you can guess the low res mode by now. We halve the width to 320 but we keep the height the same at 200 giving us a total of four planes double the previous bit depth and therefore four times the colour at 16. This was the on-screen maximum for the ST and what most games ran in this mode as it offered the best compromise of colour and the lower resolution, which on a CRT was much less of an issue than on modern fixed panel hold and display screens. Now the Commodore machine was very similar to much of this, although it did have up to 5 planes to choose from as standard, with a 6th used for limited functions such as extra half bright mode or ham mode, or the dual play field mode. Now based on the same logic we have a 6 bit maximum depth here, and a similar 320x256 display for PAL or CCAM, and the lower 240 height for NTSC screens. Now as you increase the bit depth you also doubled the previous colours, to a 32 colour maximum that the Amiga would hit most often. 
Britain. This simply translates to what we've just covered before, right up to five planes and 32 colours. Now, it had another core feature though, and that was its play field. It could support two at once, giving parallax scrolling in games. This is the effect of a depth, as a foreground field scrolled slower than a background one. Now, the limit here is each play field could only be comprised of three bit planes, so eight colours per play field. It's actually seven, as one binary allocation is reserved for transparency on each to allow sections to show through, which reduces the on-screen maximum by half. Now, these tricks help it keep up with the incoming 16-bit consoles that launched many years later, such as the Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo, and it did. It competed well into the mid-90s at times with these machines, even beating them on sound still. Well, maybe not so much on the Super Nintendo. Now, due to the way each machine allocated memory and video sizes, the ST is much simpler, allowing a maximum of three screen options and using a bit flag to determine how this fixed 32 kilobyte memory size is interpreted. The Amiga had to share RAM with all of the functions and DMA actions, and this is far more important in a multitasking machine like this, as memory can be in high demand and low supply. Each of the circa 20 display modes it had allocated memory differently and this included a double buffered display mode. For example, a low resolution but higher colour count screen would actually use less RAM than a low colour but high resolution one and this mixture of choice shared memory pools, modes and chips was the machine's biggest advantage and USP. To compensate for the speed deficit here, the Atari ST titles regularly used to skip huge chunks of pixel movement, which you can see here on Shadow of the Beast, or scrolling down the screen. It's jumping around 8 to 16 pixels, and even at a slower half refresh rate. And this can actually end up with the game being faster on the ST, because it's just skipping huge chunks of movement through the animation. A sacrifice from its lack of hardware scrolling. But in animated sections, the ST could actually be faster and smoother than the Amiga, such as the Shadow of the Beast 2 intro sequence. Now keep in mind here that the extra copper and blitter the Amiga had, as covered last time, these could run in parallel with the CPU, purely for graphic functions. Think of it as an incredibly simple GPU. Also the Paula sound processor could create sound via its own DMA channels, which again gave the CPU more breathing space, even if the ST CPU was a little faster. Now this is a very high level view of the machines, but I hope provides a balanced overview of how they generated graphics on screen which should help you appreciate of almost a decade's worth of active development from this small selection. It covered a choice of arcade ports, shoot 'em ups racers, platformers, adventure games, and even some full-on polygon pushing 3D. If you have any questions though, hold them till the end as we tick these off. Let us start one of the biggest genres still at the time, shoot 'em ups. Now this is a good one to start with, a great game if not the best on either machine for this category. It highlights the first common difference, scrolling. See, the ST rarely had horizontal scrolling that was as smooth as the Amiga, and Blood Money is an almost perfect exception to this. Based on what we know, the Amiga's hardware scrolling, like an enhanced C64, could pixel scroll via an offset in the register up to 16 pixels before a new image refresh would be required. This was a larger screen than you can see in the window or viewport, and then shifted across using this hardware while you built more columns and swapped this out at the right time to keep it going. The ST had to do this via software, and as this results in the common occurrence of ST play areas being smaller or narrower than the Amiga. Now, this was due to them having to draw the image into this area that was blocked off and shifting it in. A technique known as pre-shifting was also used on software sprites to compensate for the hardware ones the Amiga had. The result is a slower game pace but manages to avoid word scrolling, i.e. 16 pixels at a time on the ST. Blood Money manages single pixel shifting but holds the update for the screen action one refresh cycle longer than the Amiga. It's still smooth, but it's notable over the faster Amiga version. You can now appreciate some of the hoops these teams jump through on the SD. The result is the Amiga now has a much faster game logic and plays even faster. Although they both target a 50Hz update schedule, Atari players get a slower and slightly easier game as a result. The other is sound. The Amiga can offer three channel music and one sound effect, which all comprise of samples and sound fuller and cleaner than the SD. 
Well, anyway, not at the same time. As a common trait back then, you chose sound or music and not both. Even though this is the case, the Amiga still wins out on the sound score. All in all, this is a great ST version that uses the hardware very well to get as close as it does to the competition. You can also notice the Atari ST has a green hue and uses that colour more predominantly than the blues and the lighter colours on the Amiga due to the expanded colour palette. But it is very close indeed, and certainly one of the closer ties between these two machines. So, we've set a precedent with our first game, and a huge game such as Xenon 2 that was and is heralded as one of the Amiga classics should paint a bigger gap. Not so. The first thing is, this is another vertical scroller like its prequel, and as such, removed one of the biggest hurdles the ST had. The raster drawing method makes this almost a non-issue for scrolling, one of the reasons this was used so extensively in arcades, consoles and computers, as it plays into that strength. Now an equally smooth scrolling title on both of the machines is the result, as are the visuals themselves. A common statement from the time on the Amiga was the dreaded poor ST port, something I occasionally chuckle at now when I hear some players mention it like it's a new thing, but as the saying goes, there's nothing new under the sun. It was a common occurrence even back in the 8-bit days, but even though this was never branded as one, it was. As we can now see, then as now, multi-platform titles developers will target the lowest common denominator. And in this case, that was the ST. The iconic metallic pixel shaded art is designed with the 16 colour palette in mind and it looked incredible then and now. Programmed quite contentiously by the assembly line that later took the bitmaps to court for it, this was all assembly coded to the 68,000 CPUs they both sported. Vertical scrolling left an almost identical looking game on both. Screen size, colour depth, sprite quantity and action are nigh on identical. Even the performance is a mirror, running at half field rate of 16.5 FPS or 60 milliseconds. The screen still updates every 20 milliseconds as you can see from the Z Blast effect. The only thing that splits these is the Amiga version is able to deliver the same sample track in game that the ST could only deliver its version of in the menu screen. At DMA Boost again. They both drop tracks to the sound effects but this was a minor sacrifice for a game that still looks and plays this good. Aside from dodgy collision detection at times, it was a standout title for the Amiga and yet it never even took advantage of many of the aspects of it. And with that we see yet another draw. Other shooters painted a mixture of trends with smaller screen sizes, cutbacks on frame rates as the Amiga could deliver 50 or 60 hertz titles with a far greater regularity than the ST, but these big shooters certainly paint a much smaller gap than the hardware specs would paint. We need more. And platformers have been around for almost as long as games themselves, but the later 8-bit and certainly 16-bit machines ushered in the wave of scrolling platformers. Core Design made a big impact with this long before they put Derby on the game creation map. They again used history of a different kind in Chuck Rock that would later see it becoming a big franchise for them. Now with the first title they again targeted the ST and Amiga, but from the animated intro sequence that took up an entire floppy disk, a growing trend in these mid-years of the machines, you would hardly spot a difference between them. That colour palette and lack of extra chips seems to do little to split the Commodore from the Atari. But in game, the picture is vastly different. 
Now the game was a simple push-scrolling chunked off platformer that split the worlds down into short horizontal and vertical scrolling segments as you tried to rescue your wife from the villainous Gary Gritter. Uh, little did they know the ramifications of that nameplate in later reality, that's for sure. Now, dodginess aside, your hero can run, jump and belly bash his enemies out of the way. Fix paths of patrol and larger sprite-filling monsters aside, the challenge comes from very simple puzzles to continue and the awkward attack move over the enemies themselves. Now, the Amiga is not a port, more so the target for the game, and then scale back to fit the ST. And this includes some excellent work on the art and colour itself. The ST has a darker, edgier tone over the Amiga's brighter cartoon style. Rock, shrubs and characters have a very different look to them on the Atari machine, which demonstrates this was a laboured and lovely redesign to better suit the hardware limits. Now, speed and depth is another. The playfields of the Amiga are instantly evident, giving that dual-scrolling parallax look that will become synonymous with 16-bit platformers in addition to those dual-scrolling levels as well. It also has larger sprites and obstacles, such as the pooping dinosaur danger here which is completely missing on the ST and I think you can see the other split performance the ST runs at half the frame rate at best of the Amiga even with all these cutbacks the hardware scrolling the blitter chip and the copper can do just so much more at twice the speed when they are used and core design use them well now, sound is a common split we have covered already and almost always remains. This will be the last time I specifically mention it in relation to the Atari computer as a bonus. But even though title screens and such allow them both to stretch their audio muscle a little more than in-game, even here, the Amiga can excel further. With the rock band, you get the pun there, of Chuck Rock outperforming the competition from the start and throughout. This was a clear whitewash for the Amiga, and it flips our first two games completely on their head. Now, Zool does little to change that picture, with Gremlin very obviously targeting the Sonic Brigade with its fast, attitude fueled edgy... Uh, ninja, speed would have to be a key feature, and thus 50 or 60 hertz was the target from the get-go. Remember, this is fields per second, not frames per second. Large sprites, vast quantities on screen, long and tall levels, this was a great platformer for the computer market. Even if it later hit both main 16-bit consoles, this was an Amiga game at its heart. It can certainly dip a little with the sprites and blitter work. This can cause some drops on scrolling at times, but the split of hardware still allowed the Amiga to update the screen even if scrolling could slow down. We do still see a few drops below that 20 millisecond target and you can go mad with projectiles, scrolling and enemies. It hands in one of the fastest if not smoothest scrolling games on the Amiga with a bright palette to finish the sickly sweet style. Now the Atari machine was always going to struggle here and it shows from the off rather than cut back more of the game design we see a more washed out colour tone due to the palette reduction and far worse performance it rarely hits the 20 milliseconds refresh even if that is still the same target. It's largely running around half or a third of that in heavier sections. It simply means if the Amiga dips the ST will simply dip more. The game still shifts a huge quantity of sprites and objects, which is a technical marvel on such a machine, but the performance does show the signs of strain. They even crammed in the raster gradient dual playfield effect here, which is a great touch and a nice addition, but it again paints a very clear victory for the Amiga. And even though this is a fun game at the time and it really targeted that platform in action, it doesn't really stand the test of time now, I'm afraid. But if you are going to pick this up, then the Commodore Amiga is clearly the winner here. Ah, praise the gods. This was the tale of another pretender to Mount Olympus infamy long before Kratos threw his hand in. The Bitmap Brothers sent Hercules on a Greek adventure. This was a puzzle-based action platformer. It was the next big game after the ones that they'd hit before, such as Xenon 2 and Speedball. The Bitmap Brothers were specifically a huge hit in the 16-bit era, certainly on the Amiga and the ST. They set the world alight. And they again used the ST as the base for the game. So much so 
so that it can be hard to pick the two apart in screenshots, or even move in action. It did have some other fiendish puzzle platform and combat design, with AI, or at least routines, being dynamic and based on a few factors. I do recall magazines at the time waxing a little too lyrical on these charms, mind. Now, it was certainly an intelligent platformer, which was a new thing. This largely came down to dropping you extra lives or health based on your current energy level or spawning more or less monsters at fixed points in the level. Now, both versions kick off with a fully sampled soundtrack, now a signature addition to their games, and aside some sample rate improvements on the Amiga, they are practically identical. Sixteen colour designed art means the stylish and trademark metallic look they championed gives it that distinct aesthetic identical on both. The only time you can really see the extra palette choice on the Amiga is in the raster gradient effect on the rear playfield. Very minor and easily missed. Now aside this we have the same boost to sound again very small the DMA action and extra channels of the Commodore enabled more samples that are better quality than the ST but both lack in-game music something which the Mega Drive version boosted alongside other benefits. Now these two computer versions are nigh on twins slightly better performance on the Amiga notwithstanding this is a classic game on both and clearly another ST port. Now one more platformer comes for those that may think marketing deals with games are a new thing. One of the bigger platformers from the era was James Pond. The biggest sequel, Robocod, look these are not my puns okay, they had a marketing deal with Penguin, a chocolate snack biscuit in the UK and I believe parts of Europe was front and centre in the story and funding of the title. This really centred more around the intro sequence and obviously saving the penguins throughout the game. But the game itself followed the popular themed world of games of all this type and the later 3D platformers. Now it may not look it but the game actually pushed the Amiga quite hard using the copper to increase colours, smooth scrolling, large sprites and vast levels and it ran at the same fast 50hz rate Azul. It was more in the Mario style platformer than Sonic. It could still dip a little, scrolling and animation could suffer at certain points but this was one of the better platformers to hit the format. The ST version does its best to keep all things visually as good, intro is present, sound is slightly worse but the bright colours, large levels and big sprites are pretty much all intact, with the cost being performance again. It hits 25Hz rather than 50 and can still dip on occasion below that but the biggest cost is the scrolling. This exhibits the basic word scrolling I mentioned at the start, leaping big pixels rather than per pixel. A slower refresh rate and poor scrolling leaves the game juddering in all directions and is worse when on moving platforms as you can see the lurching in the movement. Still a great port and just as much fun as the Amiga version but when it comes down to a choice of which fish is the biggest in this pond then the Commodore comes out king, prawn. Look it's in keeping with the game okay. Now although this was not the instigator of the scrolling beat em up with two sad brothers chasing the girl of their dreams into the very wrong neighbourhood, they clearly need to get out more though as this twisted target for their affections requires a fight to the death before she will date the winner. Uh, not sure she's wedding material after all guys. Now extreme signs of affection aside, this kicked off a generation of side scrolling vigilante type clones and it was a machine that was in my local chip shop. Remember when you could pop down for Friday night fish and chips and chuck a couple of 20 peas into a game while you decided what to eat. And the port is decent if a long way off the arcade. This is another clear ST port. From scrolling, sprite, speed and almost sound you would be hard pressed to tell these two apart. Now this was still the days of farmed off bedroom coding jobs that would be based on videotape or if you were lucky direct arcade machine play to get the game converted. At this point the ST was still the dominant force on the home market and as such an ST port over the Amiga made the most financial sense than a longer plan. If you're looking to play this classic beat em up then any other machine will see you right, a clear draw if I ever saw one. Uh, uh, uh. 
which continues almost perfectly with Altered Beast and what is a half-decent but far from arcade-perfect port on the computer format and ironically was the game that made me import my very first Mega Drive from Japan, as at this point some of the best Amiga games had yet to launch but these two games side by side on the respective platforms gave you a clear winner from Sega's Box of Wonders. Now, Like many titles though, this paints the efforts of the ports rather than the weakness of the machines. Aside a slightly bigger screen and better sound, the only other difference is a very, very minor performance improvement over the ST, but really this is another draw and as an Amiga owner it made me yearn for that console power that little bit more. And not all was bad though, the PC port was absolutely horrendous. Even with multiple sound card options and EGA graphics, it managed to be worse than the 8-bit Master System version. And that was a shocking turn of events. This is to be avoided at all costs, but arcade ports were rarely at the level they could or should have been. And do not even get me started on OutRun, although Hang On was a little better at least. So platformers, arcade conversions, what else can we look at? Well, racing is always a good shout, and Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge was a groundbreaking title at the time. This was made to compete with smooth and loved console racing games that had been appearing all over the shop. The first game had a split screen fixed into both play modes and offered a bright, colourful and vibrant racer, complete with outrun style music selector and a packed grid of cars. This was the target after all. Now clever cutbacks played into the hardware strengths such as only two vehicle sprites duplicated across the screen as needed using the blitter and V sprite tricks. The second game pushed things a little more, again visual quality was improved on the Amiga with the road lines and the frame rate took a hit due to the increase in screen size and it also catered for dual play which was a pioneering cross platform play possible with a connected serial cable connecting the two machines up you could play on the Amiga to the ST or ST to ST or Amiga to Amiga two player full screen network racing oh the joys of open platform development now the third game was running out of ways to change it up a track editor was a good start although limited it did allow you to create your own tracks and this kept the bigger screen of two but performance was not quite as good. It also hit the PC and this was a little faster and smoother than the Amiga, so long as you had the uber expensive kit at the time mind and didn't mind a little bit of tearing to go along with it. But sound still lacked the quality of the Commodore, even with a Roland sound card in your stack, it really didn't quite stack up to the Amiga's audio pipes. The Amiga just pips the ST here but not by a huge margin and again this feels as a game that could have done more with the hardware but takes nothing away from the classic and huge hit the series is and was at the time. Staying in racing though, but moving into full 3D, we have Hard Driving 2, which was a game that was used to help new drivers pass their test in the UK. Not really sure what benefit driving in slow motion would have been, but to be fair, the arcade version did at least run a little faster than what you see here. But now powering into the Vert's world, everything is drawn from polygons and the performance is, well, see for yourself. The bitter on the Amiga could have helped due to its line drawing and shape filling functions. Looking at the results though, I think we're pretty sure here that this was not used. Instead, a purely CPU driven software render is used and due to the slightly faster CPU, the ST clearly wins the battle of the fastest, slowest racing game of the two. Small victory, but 
but a win's a win, and the Atari gets this one. Now, other titles such as Vroom use the mixture of polygons and sprites much better, resulting in a fast and exhilarating experience with a near constant 17 FPS rate. Extra touches such as screen shade under tunnels with a corresponding whoosh as they do. Hard driving was not the exemplar demo of racing titles on either machine, but it did at least highlight how straight CPU ports could suffer, slightly more on the Amiga and to a much lesser extent on the ST. Which is one polygon world to another, Maelstrom Games created something new, Midwinter. Now this first person post-apocalyptic snow-filled terrain offered a wealth of characters, vehicles, weapons and enemies, and did not confine itself to one genre. Strategy, role-playing, action, first-person view, a deep backstory for each of the crew members you could control in this adventure. It also pushed forward with tech, using a fully 3D polygon-constructed world to carve this survival tale within. You had a true sense this was something special at the time. Of course, it's easy to look back at this now and see the tiny screen, dithered pixel polygons and 5 frames per second performance, but this was all very new and was the peak of the experience you could expect at the time. It would be another three years until AM2 and Sega set the bar for 3D visuals in virtual racing, and that was a few thousand pound dedicated arcade machine. This was all running on a 300 pound home computer in the ST. It was a game changer, and make no mistake. Now, the Amiga version came after the ST and PC releases, but not much changed between them. Visual quality, colours, and performance are almost identical to the Atari machine. The PC version having access to much, much more expensive CPUs than the paradigm shifting Intel 386 and the later 486s could push the performance up and also boost colours to 256 using the new IBM MCGA or VGA standards, but these were again into the thousands and far beyond the Amiga and ST market. A comparable 802.86AT was still more expensive and no better than these circa 8 MHz computers. The design from these PCs and ST build limited the entire polygon rendering to the CPU, something which carried over to the Commodore PC port. A Blitter incorporated render method may have helped performance a little, instead we see a practical carbon copy on these machines, and even the top end 486 version you can see here offered a welcome performance boost it allows to really split these aside that. This clearly has not aged well at all, but for the time, this was bleeding edge. No conversation about gaming in the 16-bit computer era would be complete without bringing in graphic adventures. They really were a bedrock of the platform and a massive part of my childhood. On the Amiga, the ST and the PC, I played so many I lost count. And one of the reasons I got so hooked into story-driven games is these really ticked that box well. Early titles, such as Defender of the Crown, really caused heads to turn for the Amiga. This was like nothing else on the market at the time. Bright colours, lush animated sequences and a mixture of strategy with a cinematic flair, it hinted at the direction games could take. The desert, unchanged for millions of years, yet witness to a biblical prophecy come true that one day the meek shall inherit the earth. Now, many titles from big American publishers moved away from getting low down with the metal. Monstrous games from Lucasfilm such as Loom, Zap McCracken and the almighty secret of Monkey Island here were all written in C rather than assembly. Now, a good choice as porting to the collection of computers on the market was much simpler, using this language and then allowing the compiler to push onto the relevant platform. Now, this would not remove the option to use the dedicated chips in the Amiga, but many of the titles did not and really did not need to. The Paula chipset still kept it way above the ST, but it was starting to feel the pressure from the PC, but it still held its own. Just listen for yourself. Now, visually, the game is a point-and-click adventure. Using the Scum GUI and Control, it is slow on all machines, with the option on PC to boost image quality via its 256 colours on screen and a faster CPU. You really needed to spend big to get this at the time. 
The ST puts in a good fight and delivers an EGA style image quality, 16 colors, which would have been much worse had the art team not designed all of the graphics for this lower base, and not just for the ST mine. Recall, PCs in the States were largely at this level and again here in the UK, such as the transparent effect of LeChuck and the objects here having a dotted edge line and using blacks and blues far more than the Amiga and VGA version, which had a wider palette and therefore were designed around this. The Amiga's 32 color palette puts up a good fight against the VGA 256 colors of the PC, not quite getting there with the shading level, but still, considering how long ago this launched, it was still putting in a very good fight. Strategy games were another big thing for the platform, and nothing comes bigger than Populous at the time, creating its own god simulation genre. Even though this was an incredible title on both the Amiga and the ST, this was an ST port again. It was made for the ST and just ported straight across to the Amiga, really using none of the extra chips such as the Blitter or Copper at all, and it is a standard ST port and runs pretty much identical to the ST. So if you are playing the game, you're not missing anything out. This doesn't make the game bad at all. It just shows that an ST port doesn't mean bad game. That is what a lot of people used to say at the time, and it is incorrect. Populous is anything but a bad game, but Populous 2 did at least push the boat out and use the hardware on the Amiga much better with much faster performance and better colours. Other titles such as Powermonger again used 3D polygon rendering and even though it had some slow issues was a looker at the time and really worked well. And everyone remembers Lemmings from Psygnosis. This was a classic title and I spent months of my life playing this game. So simple and yet so addictive to get each one of those little Lemmings back to the exit point. And this was yet another title that was an ST port, or at least based around ST hardware. The Amiga had slightly better sound, but I'm starting to sound like a stuck record when I keep saying that. So many incredible titles on these platforms, so games like Turrican 2 or Turrican from Factor 5 who really knew how to push the hardware, even though the ST version suffers from performance, it is still an incredible game on that hardware and uses it well, even keeping the sample beginning soundtrack of the menu screen that also plays on the Amiga, but again, it doesn't quite sound as good. The game itself plays faster and smoother on the Amiga of course, but it's still a technical benchmark and Factor 5 really knew how to push hardware and platforms, something which I'll be covering very soon. Now I'm sure many of you now are screaming at the screen at me saying how many titles I've missed and I know there's so many here that I've missed, so many more that I've played that I just couldn't fit on the screen, some of which have been flashing up before you. And you can even play a little quiz. From the beginning of the video right up to where Shadow of the Beast 2 starts, can you name all of the games that I show during that intro sequence? And a bonus point for those that can also match the game that the music is being played from that starts with the ST and blends into the Amiga. Now I've really enjoyed my look back at two giants of my past and video games history. These are the machines I grew up with, and I've had them now in my attic for the past few years, and now that I've pulled them back out and have them in operation after some mild repairs, I think I may be enjoying them for many more years to come. This was a much simpler, almost naive time. Games still had so much potential, and almost every few weeks, something brand new and exciting would arrive. Developers were normally still in the single digits for entire projects, and budgets did not make your eyes water and your bank balance crumble. And yet these still captured our minds, imagination and hearts just as much as the current mouth-watering AAA or smaller indie titles do. These computers formed a significant period of my childhood, one that I hope many of you watching also shared and can recall. They are, after all, the reason I even got into developing and writing software and became an engineer as a full-time career. Such a simpler time, no internet or crowds to ruin your enjoyment or tell you what was good or bad, a time when a cover could be a total red herring on the game itself, and yet you shared games with friends, played them till the wee hours and flicked through game magazines hungry to glimpse the next big thing that was just around the corner. They were good times indeed. These were the machines that made modern gaming real. These were the 16-bit pioneers. I hope you enjoyed this two-part look back at the 16-bit computer market and even a little dabble into that PC area of the time. There's much more here to cover, but I wanted to keep this on point and in focus. Please leave all your thoughts and feedback below, and if you enjoyed this or any of my other content, you can subscribe and like and even buy me a drink or a sandwich by using the Patreon link below. 
I am completely self-funded and independent and these videos are not that easy to put together. So you can help by liking, sharing where appropriate and also follow me on Twitter. You can also chat with me there if you so wish. Anyway, I'm out, but always keep it deconstructed.